My name is David Wong. This is Decoupled Front End in the Future. Um, we're going to mostly talk about quote unquote headless Drupal. Um, it, it's not going to be a, a very technical talk. I mean, we're not going to be sharing code or like, hey, use this directive here. Uh, it's going to be mostly high level about you know the implications of using going headless, uh, the difficulties and or challenges faced when going headless, and what headless actually means. Um, and so, if you're here expecting you know code snippets and how tos. This might not be the session for you, but if you wanted to have uh, a discussion about the practice of doing headless, uh, wh what this entails, um, then you're in the right place. Uh, so this is your, your last chance, I guess, to escape and offer up your seat to somebody else. Um, again, decoupled front end in the future. Uh, my name is David Wong. Uh, I'm Eatings on Twitter. Uh, I don't actually talk very much about headless on Twitter, so you, you know, th there's one reason not to follow me. I actually post a lot of Instagram images. Um, I've given this talk a, a number of times already to a different uh, audience every time. I've talked in front of developers, I've talked in front of designers, and I've talked in front of JavaScript people who you know, could give you know, two craps about what Drupal was. Uh, and so uh, if I ramble a little bit, it's because I've tried to make this talk uh, a little more inclusive than straight Drupal devs talking at each other. And I actually only have about 20 minutes of slides prepared because I'm hoping to hear back from you guys. I certainly don't feel like the end all uh, master or, or the person who knows everything there is to, to know about this particular subject. And so uh, the microphone there is for uh, questions and discussion afterwards. Uh, I work for a company called Acquia, as you probably have noticed by my shirt. Uh, and this is version 0 0.9 of uh, this talk. Uh, I've given it, like I said, three times already. Uh, because most JavaScript MVC frameworks are like 0 0.1 anyway, um, I figure this talk is never going to be perfect. Uh, but if we're here to talk about things like that, we're okay with less imperfection. Um, something like that. So we're here to talk about, ostensibly, quote unquote, headless Drupal. Uh, I, uh, actually, let's do a first show of hands. Who's heard about the concept headless Drupal? It, th does this word mean something to people? Okay. Um, Usually when I ask people about headless Drupal, I usually get two reactions. I, I get that or that. Um, you know, and, and so you're either super excited, like, yes, headless Drupal, the culmination of my dreams, um, or what the hell are you talking about? And uh, I, I threw this one in for my nieces. This is her favorite movie. Uh, and as by proximity, also mine now, apparently. Um, so what is headless, right? What is headless? Everybody has an idea of what headless is. And I think all, what, 400 people have joined the headless Drupal group on G.O uh, with a different conception of what headless might mean. Um, for some, headless is Drupal as a content model and entity API minus the client-facing theme layer. Uh, for some, headless just means Drupal as a RESTful web services endpoint. Uh, for some, headless means Drupal serving as a content repository for a greater system of web properties or web apps. Uh, for some, headless simply means bring your own front end. I want to bring my own front end to Drupal. Uh, uh, more prosaically, uh, your app up front, Drupal in the back. You know, whether it be another CMS system, uh, it need not necessarily be JavaScript. And yes, of course, headless Drupal does also entail client-side JavaScript MVC frameworks rendering Drupal data. And this is the popular and, and, and the widespread conception of what headless is. But my point here is that Headless is a lot more than that. You, know, you talk to headless and some people are like, oh, Drush, Drush is headless. Well, yeah, Drush is headless Drupal too. Uh, this is a minority of use cases in the wild right now of quote unquote headless Drupal. Uh, the JavaScript MVC framework use case is actually a small sliver of this wider use case of using Drupal as a services endpoint. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. So why would you go with, with headless Drupal? Why would you not use the totality of Drupal? Why would you chop a piece of it off? Um, so these are some of the things you might get. You get complete separation of concerns. Maybe Drupal isn't or shouldn't be the everything to you. You get a Drupal backend and a front-end app of some kind. And when I mean front-end app, I'm being very agnostic about front-end app. Your iOS app, your Android app, uh, your, your other CMS app, um, you know, Drupal feeding something like Apogee. You know, all of these are headless use cases. Um, you can, in theory, get ultimate control of your front-end stack. When you rip off the Drupal front-end and bring your own front-end app, you bring your front end to the table. It is absolutely yours to 100% control and, and tweak as you like. And for those of you who are themers and traditional themers uh, of Drupal, um, the, you know, this is a Drupal site. This is from a demo framework, uh, a, a, an open source uh, a demo installation of Drupal that we use quite frequently at Acquia. Um, so let, let's take a look. Um, Let's just say this image right here, 36 hours in Brooklyn, right? It's just an image and a view, right? It's, it's just got a label. How hard can it be? How ugly can the markup be, right? 
right? And, and there are people who've been railing about this for years. I've been doing Drupal for seven of those years, and as long as I've been in Drupal, uh, there's been a certain individual, let's say the king of Denmark, uh, who has been railing against this sort of thing forever. And it's been, you know, he's been pushing that stone up that hill for seven years. And you know, this is Drupal 7. This is after years and years of his, of his complaining and cursing, and this is still what we have. Right, and I, I, at this point, I was going to do a morning impression, but since he's not in the room, I won't. Um, but but catch me at a party, and I might do it. Um, uh, you you get all the power of Drupal's content modeling tools, right? We're not taking any of that away. Drupal's content modeling, Drupal's content authoring and workflow, all these things that we use on the Drupal quote unquote back end. You know, none of this goes away when you take away its front end, right? Uh, users' roles and permissions. This is a huge pain to to implement on your own. Like you get this for free, for free, right? Um, and all the restful serialized entity data you can eat, right? Because Drupal just spits that out willy-nilly um, as easily as uh, you'd like it to. And I wish Jeff Eaton or somebody like that were in this room right now. Uh, this value cannot be oversold. You know, like we, we get, there's this Drupal community obsession with, with oh, you know, it, it, Drupal's so point and clicky. And, and even outside of the Drupal community, it's so easy to point and click. You know, it's, Drupal's for point and click developers. It's not for real developers. But from a content modeling and information architecture and uh, content management, for lack of a better word, perspective, you know, nobody ever said, oh, crap, I just point and clicked my way to a really robust content model. Nobody ever complains about that, right? Like, if you want to go and write it and extend your own classes, you know, be my guest, but... You know, point and clicking, you can do a lot damn worse than creating robust relational content models point and clicking wise. Uh, and doing this, you know, using Drupal says as a service layer, I mean, um, takes us one step closer to that mythical holy grail of write once, publish everywhere, right? You know, like th th this, this sort of idea that we're never going to be able to write specific bits of content. We can't keep chasing uh, devices and, 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 and contexts as they pop up. Like we have to get a step ahead. We have to be more agnostic. We can't be just, oh, okay, now we got to make an iPhone you know, view or we got to make an iPad view. Oh crap, now we have to make something to adapt for our watches. We have to be more agnostic from the get-go. And as a bonus, nobody says you can't keep your headed sites either, right? Like, you know, you can have headless Drupal and headed sites working side by side or even at the same URL if you wanted. Um, none of that goes away. <coughs> what does go away, though, are the things you don't get. And this is where it gets tricky. Um, anything that comes from Drupal's front end, and, and this depends, right? I'm saying anything right now. So let, let's assume that we're doing a fully headless site. We have cut off the theme layer entirely. You don't get anything from Drupal's front end. Drupal is a data service at this point. And so all the things that you relied upon from Drupal's front end, from like anything that comes from Drupal's render pipeline, oh yeah, that's kind of gone. Um, anything that involves, say, drag and drop visual templating, anything that you know allows site builders to say, oh yeah, I want this panel here, I want this block there, oh, and I want this block there and rendered as this display or this view mode. Yeah, that, that's kind of your front end's problem now, right? It's no longer Drupal's problem. Drupal's not going to give that to you right now, at least not the way it's architected. And we'll talk about that as well too. Uh, panels, display suite, modules, any of those Drupal components that otherwise might inform things like display, that might help you display things, that might do it for you without you thinking. You know, these go by the wayside, you know, like you, you, it, it's one of those things like uh, you want, it, it's like when you divorce your parents at 17, right? You want emancipation? Sure, but you know, you're not getting an allowance anymore. Uh, uh, front end facing form API, form API, you know, welcome to rolling your own form API. Um, basically, anything that comes from Drupal's front end. And I'm taking a hard line here saying that, you know, we're, we're, you know this is the, 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 the headless Drupal that you've heard about. Maybe the, not the headless Drupal you've built, but the headless Drupal you've heard about. Um, you know, Josh Koenig's talked about this a lot, and we actually co-presented this about a month ago. Um, the idea that we're going to completely chop off the front end. Now, there's degrees to this, and I'll show you some examples of, of where these degrees can take place. Like, we don't have to unilaterally chop off Drupal's front end, but if the ultimate goal is to have complete independence of front end and back end, these are some of the implications that we have to live with, at least for now. And these are not trivial hurdles. I, I, I want to, to reemphasize this. Like, this is not something you go in and say, damn it, I'm going to do it. You know, and, and, and screw it, this is going to be easy, and, and, and these frameworks make all this work easy, because it can't be overstated how much of your customers, of your clients, of the people who end up using your Drupal sites, 
who aren't necessarily developing your Drupal sites rely on these functionalities or have come to accept Drupal as that thing that provides that functionality. You know, for years and years and years, we've sold and we've built and we've evangelized Drupal as this particular thing that will give you all these features and all these functionalities. And now comes along in the last year a practice that says, yes, we will make our front-end developers' lives easier. We're going to embrace these new technologies. We are going to draw the line here for our developers. And what I haven't really seen is much of a conversation around, well, what are the implications for the users of these sites? What, is it, what are the implications for the perception of Drupal at large? You know, what does this mean about what's Drupal's role in all of this? Because it is changing. And the changes that I just talked about are huge. They're not trivial. And that sort of discussion is sort of fallen by the wayside. It gets a little, you know, sweep, swept under the rug. Like, oh, yeah, you know, like, well, that's just something we just have to accept when we go down this route. Well, I don't think all parties involved have really considered what going down this route means. I think we've talked at great length about the technological benefits, but, you know, how this changes Drupal's positioning uh, to clients, to users, to site builders is tremendous. And it's something that I would like to talk about today. And all of this comes down to the fact that Drupal's theme system within Drupal itself is privileged, right? Drupal's theme system has access to things that the services layer right now in Drupal does not, or at least does not easily have. So why in the world would we even do this thing? You know, after we talked about like the pluses and the minuses, why would one want to do this? And there are compelling reasons for why would one want to do this. I asked this before, um, and I was going to, how many people in here identify as front-end developers? Okay, well, it's uh, about half. Okay, great. Um, the truth is front-end moves fast. It moves really fast. It moves way faster than Drupal. Drupal Contrib, and especially Drupal Core. Front-end, you know, Drupal is always chasing the, the innovations in front-end. And uh, I've, I've said this in two talks already, and uh, I, this is something that I feel very strongly, that front, Drupal is not a front-end trendsetter. It is definitely a, a follower, and sometimes a fast follower, but it's never a trendsetter, and we're always more or less at the agenda of other forces when it comes to integrating things into the Drupal front end. Separating a front end layer from Drupal allows it to move independently of Drupal itself. And so the dependencies upon Drupal and Drupal's, the Drupal pace car, let's say, you know, we can, you know, take the fast lane and move around it. Uh, it'll allow front end to move at innovation speed and let Drupal and the content model, which hopefully aren't changing as fast as your front end technologies, uh, move at its own pace. Your content model, your site when you build it, it has its own speed as well. Um, the Drupal core moves at its own speed. Drupal contrib moves at its own speed. Your site's data model has its own pace, which it might be faster or slower than Drupal. Uh, and your front end, you know, your front end technologies, the, the things that you want to leverage uh, from a technology perspective, they have their own pace as well. And it's sort of, uh, I think it's been described as the Goldilocks solution, I think by the Four Kitchens guys, that everybody gets to use the tools that they like and move at the speed that they like. Front-end developers aren't hand-shackled to the limitations of Drupal's markup or its speed or I its ability to innovate. Uh, your content creators, your content modelers, and your information architects get to use the same Drupal goodies that they've known uh, since forever and are familiar with, and your, uh, your developers who develop in Drupal get to keep the Drupal parts that they like. And, and, and this all goes back, at least for me, to the, the re lesson of the responsive web, um, which is we can't predict the next big change, at least on the front end. You know, the, the responsive web came and completely shook web development to its core. Um, Ethan Marcote's seminal article on uh, responsive web, the one with the, uh, the black and white images on a list apart, if you guys remember seeing that, came out a, a couple months after uh, Drupal 7 uh, went official 1.0. And... It was not a thing until then, and, and Drupal 7 was shipped basically in ignorance of this trend that suddenly came, blew up the, the front-end development space, and changed our work as front-enders forever, essentially, for the last four years. And what are we doing in Drupal 8 to anticipate or accommodate the next earth-shattering change that comes in front of us? Um, as an aside, uh, I want to point out that Drupal has two heads. Um, Drupal is actually a two-headed beast. There is the admin interface that has a head, um, and there's the customer-facing, you know, your, your public theme that's also a head. Um, right now, I've really only talked about cutting off one of them, um, but we'll also talk about cutting off the other one. 
So let me give you a couple examples of sites that I'm talking about who, who are at least in some way headless and maybe not headless in the way that you're thinking, but are truly headless uh, it, when, you, when you think about the, the larger uh, taxonomy of what it means to be headless. Uh, a Drupal site, for example, feeding mobile apps right now. This is a headless site. There's content that's being pushed to a device that has no... It doesn't care what the, what the endpoint is that it's pulling data from on your mobile device. This is a headless Drupal site. Um, this is Common Sense Media. I used to work for them. Um, they have uh, commonsensemedia.org. They have na native mobile apps that are pulling data directly from the Drupal website and spitting it out onto the, the Common Sense Media app. Uh, they're feeding data to set-top boxes. Uh, they have APIs that they're monetizing. This is, in many ways, headless Drupal, right? You know, the Comcast box that's pulling data out of this Drupal website, it, it's a headless Drupal instance. Um, th there's a, an unnamed client. Uh, a Drupal content is, Drupal is being used for content modeling, for narrative data. It's plugging into this massive online retail system that's fronted by Angular. So this yellow box, imagine, is its ERP system. Its blue box is Drupal. And this green box is, you know, whatever system that Drupal is also referencing. And all of this is being combined and matched together and shoved into this one web app at the top, which is powered by Angular, which is pulling its data from multiple sources. So in this case, it's not even headless <laughs> Drupal. It's Angular wrapping a constellation of systems underneath it, of which Drupal is only a small part. Uh, headless Drupal can also be, uh, let's say, if you have a Drupal site that is pushing content to other Drupal endpoints that have a public face, but this original silo does not. So for example, you have an authoring environment that's pushing content to multiple endpoints. This is, in, in a way, headless Drupal as well. And then sort of the holy grail, at least from a front-end developer, is that you have a Drupal site that is completely separated, where you have swappable front-end teams, techniques, and systems, and you have this Drupal base that's consistent. So let's say you, know, you have a Drupal base of a large site. You want to build the front-end of Ember one day. You, you're going uh, to have another team build it out of Angular. You have another team that's building it out of, uh, I don't know, React or, or whatever. I, I shouldn't be naming all, all JavaScript, but the same idea that you can build sites with a consistent Drupal backend, but let the front end be whatever you want, you know, as needed. And the last thing, um, and I don't have, to, this is not very well thought out, but, but this is, I know it's kind of a thing. You know, there, there's this talk about the Internet of Things, and it, and it comes back to this notion of being prepared for the next big thing and being, moving beyond this idea that Drupal has to own everything end to end and predict everything and that we have to keep bending Drupal. The Internet of Things, Schmidt Internet of Things. I I'm 34 years old, and I'm already seen enough of the Internet where I'm like, ah, Internet of Things, whatever. You know, let the kids have it, right? And, like, I don't even have kids yet. Um, but I think the, 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 the propositions offered there are valid. You know, like Drupal content on non-web devices. Dries has talked about this. Uh, I think everybody here at least has one non-web device that might have a browser that, you know, you, you know, oh, Drupal reading in my Kindle, eh, okay, well, who really wants to do that? You know, I, I, I think being dismissive of new technology before it really emerges is a fool's errand. And I think that if we were going to dismiss things like the Internet of Things out of hand before uh, they really have a chance to explode, we're going to look like idiots in the end if we don't, you know, bet correctly, and uh, I don't feel like, <laughs> like betting against it is a good deal. So, and this is where I get kind of out of there. What if? I'm going to preface this by Larry Garfield, the guy in the vest in the middle, uh, came up and said yesterday that Drupal's admin UI doesn't really have APIs so much as it has buttons with DB calls mapped to them. And this goes back to the idea that Drupal's theme system and Drupal's admin are privileged, privileged systems within Drupal itself. Like they have access to APIs that no other system in Drupal do. And so the <coughs> idea of making a completely decoupled but for, you know, equivalent front end is difficult is because we have an architecture like this right now. But what if all Drupal front ends were decoupled service-based apps, including the ones that ship with core? What, you know, what if the admin, if 7theme were actually 7.app and it was, say, a Backbone app, or you can swap it out with an Ember app, or you can swap it out with whatever the hell kind of app you want uh, it, you know, it, it, it versus the, the Twig theme system? You know, what if we could do that? What if Drupal was built like that from the get-go, such that these systems could be equivalents to what come with core? Um, and that, that's a bit of my challenge. Oh, no. Okay, wait, the Pantheon sign? Oh, it's because I work for Acquia, that's why. <laughs> uh, 
And so that's my challenge, you know, and th th I've had conversations with people like, what if this could be possible? What if this is the way Drupal was built, or at least a very viable option? What if this wasn't something that didn't take a tremendous <coughs> amount of work like it does now and, and, and wasn't full of compromise, you know? Or what if we, everything, including Drupal's native front end, started on the same foot as everything else? Um, and this is the little coda, and this is my little wrap up. I, I, don't, I don't have like a, a punishing or a, a, a drive home message, but Drupal has, for its existence, tried to be all things to everybody. Um, it's an all-in-one, soup-to-nuts, Drupal-shaped hammer. Everything can be solved in Drupal. Drupal wants to solve your complete web problem from the moment you, you, you want to enter content to the last bit of CSS that you render. You build the app. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, sorry, that took a second. You bend the app to Drupal, you build the use case around Drupal, and you live and die by the entire stack <laughs> until now. Everything from your, hello, there we go, presentation, content, data model, all three layers are done in Drupal and are expected to be handled by Drupal. But what if Drupal was just another layer in your stack and didn't have to own all of it? And you could swap out any piece freely at any time for any other technology that you wanted. And so my argument, at least, is by decoupling the front end, we make Drupal as a system more flexible, more useful, more relevant to developers in the world than less. And th th there's this analogy that Josh Koenig used, and I, I really love it. There's a big Venn diagram of Drupal developers, and this other circle is skilled front-end developers. And the intersection of the two is so narrow as to be almost a line, or maybe a dot. And that there's a universe of development and work that's going on that's kind of outside the purview of Drupal, and we're not leveraging it whatsoever. And if we could bring those two circles more closely into alignment, even by a fraction, we would introduce so much more fresh blood, ideas, vitality, and developers into, the, into our ecosystem than we have right now. And uh, Mr. Spock agrees with me, so. Um, so, uh, so these resources have changed a little bit. Um, uh, there's a headless Drupal working group, which is kind of like a bazaar of people throwing out their ideas, and there's not really any focus. And actually, part of the uh, the, com the reason I pitched this core conversation is to bring a little more focus to the discussion, uh, so that we have something to work something towards. I know Amitai is giving a talk later today about his work with Drupal 7 and uh, and and headless and his interpretations of how headless should go. Uh, I would highly recommend going to that too. Um, he likes to talk as much as I do, which is great. Um, uh, and I'm David, I'm Eatings on Twitter. Feel free to berate me uh, uh, on the internets. Um, and I, I wanna have a conversation here. Uh, these are all the slides I have, but I was told by Stephanie that I must have this slide on here so you can cast thy judgments upon me and, uh, and, and, rain, and rain them down like blood from the sky. Um, but uh, I, I, don't clap, uh, clap when it's over. Um, I, I would love to hear people's thoughts on this uh, at the microphone. Uh, and. and if you, I know it's going to be difficult, but if we could try doing going to the mic, and if not, if that's not going to happen, I'll just repeat it. All right, striped shirt. I should just shout. Okay, shout. Let's shout. Yeah. Um, uh, please don't shout when it's not on the recording. What we need is like a, a really a boom mic, right? You know, and like with a big fuzzy, uh, you know, like a TV show. I'll, I'll just repeat your question. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right, right. How, how do we sit versus other CMSs that have similar systems? I'm glad you asked. Um, uh, WordPress has uh, some stuff going on. That's very interesting. Um, WordPress has, oh, you can't see it. Ha, ah, this is on my screen. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Hey, everybody. WordPress has something called client.js, which is a reference backbone app uh, wrapping the WordPress JSON API. So this is a reference app that they've built um, for other developers to, to copy and to look at. Um, I know, I think it's, is it Typo3? It, it, it's one of the major um, European CMSs is working towards fundamentally transitioning their architecture such that their admin experience is a services-based architecture. And so, is it Typo3? 
Okay. I mean, it's not shipped yet, but it's something that they're actively... De- there's an initiative there to bring that to light. Um, and so, the, at least word, there's simply... There's WordPress, there's Typo3, uh, there's others there. Uh, granted, all of this is very much the cutting edge, right? Like, I'm not sounding the alarm after the, the house is burned down. Like, there, there's an ember. Um, but, you know, the, the fire has not consumed us all yet. Um, but what I would like to do is at least get in front of this problem and, and not wait until Drupal 9 to seriously have this conversation. You know, like during, you know, Drupal 8 has introduced all this great change in decoupling systems that we previously thought were monolithic. And we've broken things apart architecturally, at least on the back end. And, and I mean the very, very back end, not like the 7 theme, but like the systems underlying it that allow for much more pluggability and decomposition. Is that the right word? Yeah, de- decomposition of, of components underneath Drupal that allow, at least in theory, swappability where there was none before. And I would like to see a similar level of effort expended for the front end such that we can do similar things there. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you. Uh, on the ground. Yeah, I'd just like to get your thoughts around uh, a scenario where a client would come to us and they have a D7 site and they're really looking for a front end Mm-hmm. So their content model is already fine. Mm-hmm. Generally speaking, across the board, you know, the content doesn't need to be changed. However, they're looking for a site refresh. Mm-hmm. So your thoughts around taking an existing D7 site and moving it to a headless uh, Drupal uh, stack where we really concentrate only on the front end and the content model and structure essentially stays the same as the D7 back end. So the, 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 the question asked was, uh, a client wants to refresh their D7 site where the content model is satisfactory to them, but they want to have a front-end refresh that may be more than just CSS. Um, how would headless, you know, how would headless be yeah, a good use case for this? Right. Right. No, and, and that's one. Uh, that that's a good point. There is no clear and obvious and/or recommended way to do this right now. Everybody implements this from scratch. Go ahead. Yeah. So the, the, for the people on the TV who watch this next week, it's a Solstice project on GitHub, uh, an Angular wrapper for Solar as a, an intermediary of Drupal sites. Did, did you want uh, – Larry's actually going to step up to the mic. Wow. <laughs> Following the rules. That's why I took a seat on the aisle here right, so Larry, I could do good, that. Good job. Good job, Larry. So one of the challenges to what you're mm-hmm. describing mm-hmm. is – an awful lot of Drupal's power and flexibility mm-hmm. comes from that tight coupling right. and the fact that you know you have render arrays that are modified by a configuration that is embedded within a piece of content that controls the display. That's how you get panelizer. That's how you can't even do that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. If you have you know, a fully decoupled front end and back end, you lose a ton of that flexibility because everything is a lot more coarse grained. And if you made it as fine-grained as it is now, then you haven't actually decoupled anything. Right, right. So I'm not going to say we shouldn't do it for that reason. I'm actually going to say we desperately need to do it. Mm -hmm. But how do we make the argument that it's okay to lose per element cache capabilities like we have now with render caching in the name of this kind of decoupling? How do we make that case that certain things will break and not be possible if we don't privilege one theme system over another? How do we make that argument? I, I think, and this may not solve the problem, but the way I'd envision it always is that there would be, I, I don't want to open up the universe for any and all possible front ends, but I, I think an acceptable compromise that would get us a lot more forward, that would move us a lot more forward, is to have a reference Angular implementation that maybe is tightly coupled to Drupal, a reference backbone implementation that may be tightly coupled to Drupal, that Drupal is making assumptions about this front end to a certain <coughs> degree that would allow that kind of privileged coupling. Um, and then that you know we can at least build an Angular app. It might not be any Angular app, but it might be, you know, we might be able to 
for lack of a better descriptor, you know, something like sub-theme this, this Angular app to build Angular apps off of. It, it won't be a blank slate one, but it would make certain assumptions about Drupal, and Drupal will make certain assumptions about it, and that we would have, instead of just being tightly coupled to Twig and the render arrays and, and, and the Drupal theme system, we would have at least multiple options at that point. So, if I could continue on that. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh -huh. um, so you're not as much saying don't have a privileged front end as have multiple privileged front ends? I guess I would say, I guess is, I'm saying multiple privileged front ends is better than just one mm -hmm. and or a, a highly deprivileged one. And I get what you're saying. I don't think it's actually feasible mm -hmm. because, you know, the, the power of having everything in memory together in PHP is where that coupling and power comes from. Mm -hmm. There's just things that, you know, there's a depth that an Angular app will never get. Mm -hmm. And there's mm -hmm. a depth that a front end built with Silex or Symfony that's talking to Drupal over REST behind the scenes mm -hmm. and still serving pages is never going to get mm -hmm. that you know, unless it has render arrays spidering through it. Now, I'd love to get rid of those, all those render arrays. Mm -hmm. I'm actually asking you, please help me make this argument mm -hmm. <laughs> to fully break these things apart. Mm -hmm. But how do we make that argument that there's some level of easy flexibility that we lose when we break things apart and simplify them that way? I don't know the answer, I, so I am throwing that out. <laughs> hmm. So, while, while we marinate on these questions, I'll, I'll anyone else, please jump yeah, in yeah, too. Please, anybody who is okay. Uh, glasses, please step to the mic. Sorry, I don't know what else to say, man. Fair enough. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't have the answer either, mm -hmm. but I think that it might uh, <clears throat> make sense to like talk about specific Drupal versions now that we have the beta out and everything. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, and think of it as separate problems. I mean, I don't yes. think yes. we want to solve that particular issue in Drupal 7. No. Uh, I also think that it might make sense to, to talk about these issues like making, you know, as you said, you don't, you don't have access to form API and you don't have uh, access to the output from the field formatters and so on. So maybe think about these problems separately and try to solve each of these cases separately and <clears throat> as as you know as, as much as you as you can and achieve as much as you can but break them into uh, separate problems instead mm -hmm. of thinking it thinking of it as you know one big giant sure. issue mm -hmm. yep. um, I'm big on open data and governance mm -hmm. so wouldn't it be interesting for Drupal to be like the headliner for every single government to uh, publish their data as an mm -hmm. JSON format together with their sites in cooperation mm -hmm. and that way just push Drupal to, to more and more government sites try to promote it mm -hmm. and actually fill in a giant giant gap we have right now because a lot of governments just don't go for big data mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's a lot of tough stuff to actually deal with right now mm -hmm. they have to actually redo most of their stuff because they can't just do it mm -hmm. with the platforms they're using and if we can then in one way or another propose like yes yeah, switch to Drupal and it's basically with a click of a button and you just publish JSON data next to your current like your current front end without changing anything wouldn't that be an interesting idea to actually promote and work with yeah depends on the government <laughs> yeah, obviously. Yeah. Well, the thing is, not sure North Korea would love that. Yeah, but like Belgium is pretty big on it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, they're trying to promote mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. open data, mm -hmm. but there's not a lot of government, well, internal governments doing it because sure, they're sure, actually sure. Mm -hmm. the biggest issue is they have the current sites they're using do not support open data in one way or another. Oh, and, and the thing is, you know, Drupal 8 support for services is much better than 7's out of mm -hmm. the box, right? And then it, this is almost like a talking point at this point about Drupal 8. Like, oh, you get the REST module, and it's actually kind of nice to have it built in. Um, the, the, the question isn't that the, the REST, is REST going to be strong enough in D8? It's what are we getting out of REST, and how can we make that more robust for the needs of a, a fully baked app like this? You know, like we can get data out of Drupal just fine now. Mm -hmm. um, the question about governance like that is just, it's governance of the government. You know, it's, it's getting clients on board with, hey, let's expose some of this data. Because Drupal can do it, and fairly trivially too at that. Um, at this point, we want to make it more robust such that we can build better apps around it than just simply querying no data, let's say. Okay, thanks. All right, who, who wants to step up? Yep, go ahead. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll repeat your question, that's fine.
So, oh, that's hard to summarize. Um, uh, so I think if, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, you, to take a page from the, the single page app model where you know, you're lots and lots of JavaScript calls as needed, uh, pulling in data you know, just in time, uh, and then rendering it as needed. Yes? Sort of, okay. Um, we gotta fix this mic situation, yeah. Um, did you ever reply, Larry? Conversation. Um, I guess the, the implication of that then, I think that goes back to what David was talking about before. That means no panels, no panelizer, no display suites, no field formatters. You have re-implement all of that in your Angular app. Does anyone actually want to do that? I'm not volunteering. But how do we, you know, how, how do we have that capability without having that, you know, you're configuring the formatter as part of the, the node, but that formatter is written in HTTP code. So, like, if you if you manage to share the data that you clicked uh, in in any of these modules, like display suit, you can you could use it in in the JavaScript app to uh, to render whatever you need, and that way, like, you wouldn't take everything away, just a half of it or some part of it. So, and do it again, yes. So, so you're, you're saying you're still re-implementing your formatter, but your formatter configuration can still be on the server. Yes. One of Maybe. the. So one of the things that, that Jesse Beach and Carl Wiederman had talked about, um, and I feel like I'm sort of channeling and speaking for them as well because they couldn't be here. Uh, we talked about this in Austin. Is, uh, has anybody seen Carl Wiederman's talk about uh, writing a new render pipeline? Oh, other than Larry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you're like the, so normally it's Morton that's trolling me during my talks, and so you're, you're taking Morton's place. Um, Okay, there we go. Uh, so Carl Wiederman had proposed this new object-oriented uh, render pipeline, which was like, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. And then in the end, um, he was able to address by fragment entire rendered sections of pages uh, of nodes uh, uh, by URL. And so, you know, give me this URL, uh, this region, this block, down to this field, rendered in JSON. Um, and when, when both Jesse and I saw this, um, not to speak too much for them, it, it was just kind of, eye-opening, like, wow, why can't we have that all the time? Like, you, we're getting kind of the best of both worlds. We're getting Drupal rendered <coughs> objects in JSON, addressable by URL, that we can predictably call again and again and again. And these can be fragments of an entire rendered page. And so, you know, Drupal is informing. So the fundamental problem that we're talking about here that Larry's bringing up is that there's no way in, a, in the current services-based architecture that you can build a Drupal site easily or it, without tremendous pain that allows the author to both express content and intent for that content. And so if the author has an idea of like this needs to be a sidebar and this needs to be you know, uh, rendered as a blah, blah, blah on, on this different side, there isn't a reliable way to do this right now via our services API because you're just going to bring back a, a node, you know, unrendered uh, via uh, uh, via our JSON API and then you're going to have to decide what to do with it once you get to the Angular side. Uh, and Angular might not know anything about, you know, how Drupal might render it, you know, via plugins or via, uh, via panels or, you know, what have you. And so that, that's part of the way there. And I, I feel like this, this sort of space here, where we're trying to get Drupal to, to be all things to all people, but in a different way than it has been before, is this weird place where Jeff Eaton gets on board and people like Jesse get on board and people like myself get on board, where the content strategists are, are trying to build a more Context, context and dis device less 
sensitive Drupal, Drupal that, that's more universal, that isn't built for just desktops or just built for HTML or just built for responsive websites. Um, you know, the, the Jeff Eatons of the world, and then there's like the front end engineers of the world who want to use tools like Ember and, and, and Angular and React and, you know, whatever the hell new framework comes out tomorrow uh, because there, it's better tooling, it's more fun to do, and it's a damn sight better than Drupal's theme layer. And, and then there's the third, which I guess I, I sort of fall into, where I, I don't want Drupal to, to stay... It, it, the current Drupal model is getting a little long in the tooth, and it's hard to defend against other products that might do certain things better. Drupal as a whole might do all of it better, but that we ignore certain innovations in areas, front end or otherwise, is at our own peril because that's where talent and interest and attention are going. And we want to be able to capture at least some of that or at least be relevant in those conversations because if we don't, then it's just be like, oh, Drupal, that's a site to use to make your complex website, not much else. Oh, yeah, no. And would that be interesting in terms of steps to go into Angular? Well, right, no, th th that's absolutely possible. So th there are people who are building <laughs> Angular components into their Drupal website. So Drupal's rendering a page, and then as one of your panel blocks um, or, or panel panes is uh, an Angular widget of some kind. You know, like this This is the, if you look at Austin, uh, the, the Sally, Sally Young did a talk about, I think it was NBC, and they're using that technique. Uh, Angular embedded within Drupal as a portion, if not the majority of a display. Um, there's also people, you know, like Common Sense Media, like I gave before, where they have a headed website, regular plain old Drupal like you would make, right? And then a separate stack that mirrors that from a data level, but is just an API endpoint and all their API stuff, based stuff, whether it be iPhone apps, uh, you know, Comcast set-top boxes, whatever, I'll talk to that. So there's that as well. I mean, and that, that's what people are doing currently. The, the goal is for D, D8 or D8.x or whatever to not have to jump through hurdles, to not have to write all this services stuff, to not have to sacrifice as much as we're sacrificing, as I described, um, so that these alternative front ends can be, if not first class citizens, at least not sitting, you know, essentially in the bathroom in the tail where they are right now. Stripe shirt again. No, there's, there's a mic, there's a mic. Come on down. Hey. Um. Talking about JavaScript libraries and frameworks that might sit on top specifically for a minute and forgetting the other options that could you, you be should. the head. Okay. Yeah. Um, in your experience and from feedback you've received so far, case studies you've heard, mm -hmm. do you think there are any libraries that are a better fit than others for whatever reason, be it community, technically, whatever, for this kind of implementation with Drupal, or is it literally just, it's a free-for-all? I think it's a free-for-all. I think you, you ask three different front-end developers, they'll get three different answers. Um, I, I think the technologies are so new, and the changes, the differences between them are so opinionated that it really is just almost religious now at this point. You know, like, is Android or iPhone better, right? Uh, let's not answer it from the Cory Doctorow sense, but like from a, you know, a usability sense. You know, is your Android or iPhone better? You know, it... It, you ask three different developers, they'll tell you three different things. So the question is, if uh, right, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is, will the complexity of allowing multiple client heads to a, a Drupal site in the future lead to uh, overwhelming or, or increasing workload and/or complexity of projects? I actually think it 
I think in the long run, it actually reduce complexity in that you can just, we can, that Drupal site that you're building a head on top of may last six years, seven years, doesn't change, right? Or changes slightly, right? And you can swap out that front end as you want. You can swap out the vendor that provides that front end as you want. If you have a vendor that specializes in a particular JavaScript skill set but knows nothing about Drupal, they can still write a robust app on top of your Drupal site. Right, and somebody comes in as long as your as long as your uh, your API is well documented. I mean, people have been writing web apps on top of robust APIs for you know decades now. Sure, right. Well, that's true, and I'm not saying we should get rid of the HTML front end anyway. I'm not, I'm not saying cut off Drupal's existing head. You know, I, I'm, I'm ultimately saying, you know, give the option of either popping that one off and like a Lego man, put the one with the, with the red face on versus the yellow face, um, or, or, or alternatively have multiple heads, you know, in an array uh, on top of your shoulders, uh, each with different colors. Um, there's nothing that will, pro uh, nothing I'm proposing is saying, let's lose Drupal's current ability to publish straight to HTML. I'm never going to propose that. I'm not saying Drupal should only be a back-end architecture. Uh, never, that's never a goal. <coughs> well, I, I don't think that's necessarily true. I, I, I think having more options when it comes to publishing, given the proliferation of the context that our content is expected to be on, is only a good thing. Like limiting ourselves to HTML, I think is a fond, uh, is fondly looking over our shoulder into a past when web development was more simple. I think we should embrace complexity, we should embrace innovation, and, and, and not pretend like it's not gonna catch up to us. Yes. So I've heard a lot of talk about these swapping out of front end and front end um, systems being highly opinionated. How do you, do you see um, these front end systems being contributed back? How do you see this as impacting contribution? Um, or are they going to be so opinionated and so specific to the content model as to be unable to be contributed back to the community? Wow, that, that's a hard question. Um, I, I, I in this perfect world that I've envisioned, right, that, that isn't really fully visioned, it's more like a remembered dream than anything else, um, we would have reference apps like, a, like, you know, for each of several front ends, and that these apps would be general enough that, you know, like, like the way how base themes are. I mean, base themes are really opinionated. It's, you know, Omega-3 versus Zen versus, you know, uh, uh, versus uh, Aurora versus, what's another opinionated one? Um, Adaptive theme, your know, mothership, right? You know, all of these have strong opinions. And people in Drupal have managed to get along with those just fine, right? You know, they might have arguments in the hallways or say, you know, your system sucks, whatever. But sites get stood up all the same. Um, I don't see that model changing for something as, you know, swapping out a front end, whether it be, you know, this JavaScript framework or another. Front enders by, are by nature, I think, very opinionated. Or at least the opinionated ones end up speaking, and that <laughs> propagates more <laughs> opinions, you know, and so. Yeah, please. I just wanted to make a note about the uh, the content uh, writers. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to to realize that when we go decoupled, mm -hmm. that the um, the uh, the administration experience and the content model is far different. So it's not page centric. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's much more agnostic to the endpoint. So the difficulty in that is um, the way in which content is, is written and stored um, doesn't really allow for preview. It also requires a different um, thought process as to how to create that content. Um, so that's something that's really important. So I think uh, for this to work, first of all, it needs a, a particular type of organization and a certain level of complexity overall. That, I don't think this is a hobbyist. Oh, no, no, uh, no, not by no means. The, right, this, this is, is, yeah. is more of a oh, yeah. larger, structured organization direction. And also, the content model will likely still have to have some sort of a page-centric option for cases where you're, ex you're explaining that, you know, the author wants to have that right side bar. They want right. to have that, that sentence. So it probably the, the solution is some sort of a blended approach to structured content that's completely decoupled from the endpoint and page-centric content modeling and mm -hmm. 
you know, how that gets divided. On that point, what I'd say is those editors are going to be incapable of previewing the content to all of the endpoints that it flows, period. So what has to be important is to identify where their concerns lie. Does that person really care about the mobile experience for their users? Do, or is it just that they really care when they're compositing the day's editorial for the splash page on the home page of the site? And, and so it's, it's with anything. It's about identifying where the concerns lie from the stakeholder's point of view. Uh, but I think what's being proposed is a way of trying to think about how to deal with the fact that we are in a multi-tenanted, multi-device world and support the fact that that's going to keep growing faster than our editor's concerns will. Yeah, so um, maybe this ties in a little bit with that uh, contextual thing. But I was just going to say, I mean, just thinking about the menu system alone and the idea of having a pre-expanded section and the idea of then maybe being able to drill, open up other sections and go in. And that's been solved, you know, three, four different ways just in Drupal on board. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's going to be approached a million different ways from all the other, you know, uh, frameworks. And so, but all the user wants at the end is just that little pancake button and just mm -hmm. to click on something. But, you know, it's sort of so over-diversified. Mm -hmm. Do we really exhaust all the... No, we, we can't. Just because they're clapping doesn't mean we're done. <laughs> yeah, go, go ahead. So, so back in the days when we built our own CRMs, you know, mm -hmm. I did a lot of fiddling with trying to do headless stuff. One of the big challenges is forms. You know, you mentioned mm -hmm. forms API. And ha has there a actually been any practical thought about how we would manage the input and output of forms through this kind of thing? Right. So uh, when I mean that, you know, when I keep talking about having a reference implementation is that there is no reference implementation. There is no best practice. You know, in fact, there might only be worst practices out there. You know, who knows? Because there isn't actually that much sharing going on either. And it, I, I'm encouraged to see as many people as there are in this room today, but Certainly, anybody who's doing this sort of thing right now seems to be doing it mostly in isolation, except for a couple people who are very verbose on the G.O group and are sharing everything, like code and everything. Um, and I actually would wish they share less because they tend to dominate the channel. Um, but th there is no collaboration around this yet. It's really, really new. I mean, it is really new. Um, and there is no structure. There is no initiative. There is no uh, working community even around this. And I mean... I would at least consider it a, a minor, minor, minor victory um, if walking out of this DrupalCon there was at least a more cohesive community of discussion around this topic because um, there are obviously a lot of conversations to be had left, you know, beyond this 45-minute one. Um, and there are people who need to hear it beyond just, you know, Larry Garfield um, that who's, who need to see the, the, the importance of this use case, you know, in a more broad sense. And then on, on Larry's side, the kind of... How far have we made any kind of progress for Drupal 8 on the removing of the button that is the, you know, the, the admin functionality being a button on the form rather than being an API call? It's a slow and ongoing battle. <laughs> progress is being made. Um, like the big one is the entity API actually exists independently of the node form now, which is the first time in Drupal's history that's been the case. So that's a huge win, um, but it is an uphill battle because we're used to it's easy if I just do it all as one thing. That doesn't make it simple. That makes it easy for me to write right now, but it means all I can do is that one use case, and then that cuts off all of these other potential heads. So you know, I, I've been fighting that fight at a different architectural level for a long time, and it, it is a, a hard battle, and that's why I'm asking, you know, how do we make that case? Um, you know, something else that occurs to me. Who here is a module developer? Who's module developers in the room? So I'm going to call it to you, the same thing I've been saying in a lot of my dev talks. Um, push everything you can to your twig files in Drupal 8 because there's this wonderful little tool called twig.js that compiles twig templates, the same twig templates you have in Drupal, to JavaScript-based templates mm -hmm. instead of PHP-based templates. So you can override templates on the client side using JavaScript instead of on the server side using PHP. It's a little more work than I'm just hand-waving, but there are tools like that if we can push things to the right place that let us pick and choose selectively. 
And I think that's my best guess is, you know, we need to be able to break things at a place where, all right, this piece we can then do selectively. So mm -hmm. it's not as much rip out the head as, you know, start picking out hairs, like mm -hmm. push all display logic to big templates because then they can always be overridden and re-implemented uh, client-side in JavaScript. Um, the, the initial goal of the Whiskey Initiative and of the Scotch Initiative was to have all blocks as their own things, which means something like Facebook's uh, Big Pipe, where you, know, you load a, a skeleton and then you parallel request 20 blocks, which come back as strings and you assemble them into the page, becomes really easy to do. Um, that, that's the kind of stuff we've been trying to build, and the biggest challenge has been fighting against the architecture that is already there, that makes that really, really, really hard, and fighting against the people who are still trying to leverage that architecture. Um, so that's, yeah. that's the challenge we have is, you know, making a different set of trade-offs to make this kind of stuff <laughs> possible. And just making the case for making a different set of trade-offs is hard, even before you start coding it. No, I agree. I, it, it, I, I don't expect this to be like an easy sell to, to the larger Drupal community, but somebody's got to carry the torch, and so, you know, I'm here. Um, uh, I'm, uh, before, uh, before everybody leaves for lunch, because I'm really hungry too, and uh, I'm going to start getting cranky and saying opinionated things if I don't eat soon. Um, uh, there is a boff, uh, a headless boff at 1 o'clock in G, room G110. Um, it's right after lunch, so everybody should be you know, sleepy and satisfied, uh, and we'll have much more moderate opinions. Yes? Uh, when is it? Uh, is, is, is the boss are you talking about? <coughs> What's that? The boss you are mentioning? Yeah. Is it, I would, I would present that. Oh, you'll, you'll bring it at the boss. Okay, so if you come to the boss, he will show uh, a scaffold application he's building in Marionette uh, for writing web apps. Um, once again, um, cast your judgments upon me at this URL. Um, <coughs> uh, I'm at Eatings if you want to hate me um, or, or tell me I'm stupid. Uh, otherwise, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Um, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>